a TV critic, a presenter and a best-selling author. Clive James, who has died at the age of 80, successfully straddled the worlds of high and low culture in a career that lasted right up to his death. He even wrote his own obituary, recommending newspapers publish it to save them a bit of money. Our senior correspondent Ian Woods reports. <laughs> President Reagan arrived in Downing Street. He was there to confirm Nancy's catalogue purchase of three dozen Empire-style fireplaces. <laughs> Clive James considered himself a poet and critic first and foremost, but it was his work as a broadcaster, on TV and radio, which made him a household name. His dry acerbic wit, which was put to good effect as a TV critic in The Observer, led to him hosting shows which, essentially, took the mickey out of global TV and adverts. Those who drown are not allowed to go forward to the next day. A particular favourite was the Japanese show Endurance, which put contestants through humiliating and painful ordeals decades before I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. He was slightly conflicted in the nicest possible way, in that, uh, in that he, he was a very serious man, he was exceptionally well read uh, and very intellectually rigorous and brilliant, but at the same time he had the common touch and a very popular touch and you very rarely find that in, in, in any single person. Born in Australia, Clive James spent most of his career in Britain and was writing until a few weeks before he died. He passed away last Sunday, but his death was only announced after his funeral took place in Cambridge. A statement said Clive died almost ten years after his first terminal diagnosis and one month after he laid down his pen for the last time. He endured his ever-multiplying illnesses with patience and good humour, knowing until the last moment that he had experienced more than his fair share of this great good world. I was in serious medical trouble and I got saved. And so this is spare time. And uh, it's very important to me because I wasn't expecting to have it. And it's just good manners to try and use it well. Clive James was slightly embarrassed that he lived longer than expected, having announced his death was imminent back in 2015. But it allowed him to carry on writing, including his own obituary, which was released on his website to coincide with his death. He commended it to newspaper editors, saying it will serve as a cheaper obituary than anything most newspapers are likely to have in the freezer. I will keep updating it until they carry me to the slab, during which journey I will try to give details of my final medication. He was so prolific that reading his complete works would take many months and leaving an archive of TV humour which will leave us laughing in the years to come. Ian Woods, Sky News. It's a long way from the streets of Cogra in suburban Sydney to the ancient sandstone spires of Cambridge for a boy brought up by a single mother on the widow's pension. But that's the road Clive James has travelled. Nearly 50 years later, and an honorary fellow at his old college of Pembroke, Clive James is battling not one, but two terminal illnesses. They've taken a toll on his body but the mind of the man who is a writer, a poet, a lyricist, a linguist, a TV critic come TV star, cultural commentator and internet pioneer remains as strong as ever. Having just completed the work of a decade, a very different translation of Dante's Divine Comedy, Clive James is now racing against the clock to write the last reflections of a life lived to the full his sixth and final memoir. Okay. Ah, now, it's a long while since I've been here. New Republic observed that when England loses Clive James, it will be as if a plane crashed with five or six of its best writers on board. The New Yorker called him a brilliant bunch of guys. My special subject was swift. Clive James, it's good of you to give us the time. Kerry, it's very, very good of you to be here. 
It's a long way to come. With pleasure. Mm. How are you? The simple version of the answer is that I'm alive uh, and quite well, and I didn't expect to be because so much went wrong with me. But uh, the truth is that I've got almost everything wrong. My lungs are in bad shape. And uh, you might hear me do quite a lot of coughing soon, in which case you can lean forward and compassionately pat me on the back. <laughs> that might make it worse. <laughs> and <clears throat> I have to have my immune system replaced every three weeks at the great hospital Atten Brooks, which is nearby. So effectively that means I can't travel further than three weeks from Atten Brooks for the rest of my life. And uh, I've got leukemia, which is in remission at the moment, but might decide to come back. So when you add it all together, I'm in terrible shape. <laughs> but we're laughing. How, uh... <laughs> There's a cough. How restricted are you physically? Pretty much. I, I'm, I'm a bit of a shuffler and I can't walk very far or get even make any kind of agitated movement without, um, without getting a coughing fit or feeling tired. Yes, restricted physically. I like to... I love dancing, love dancing the tango. I won't be doing that anymore. There's a lot of things I won't be doing anymore. I won't be flying anywhere, because you need a lot of oxygen. And that means no flying back to Australia. Yeah, alas. You don't see Australia again for the I rest don't of your see life. Australia again, and it's, it weighs on me. I'm very sad about that. You copped the double whammy all in one go, didn't you? You actually, I think, went to the hospital uh, to be checked out on one condition. And yes. by the time that was over, that actually presented you with two terminal That's ones. That's the message. Don't get cured. Leukaemia, <laughs> leukaemia and emphysema. I turned up because, uh, like many men, foolish men, and most men are foolish, I'd postponed my prostate operation too long. And the night came. It was New Year's Eve of 2009, the first day of 2010, when you know, I really couldn't pee at all. So it was a case of going into the emergency unit and, uh, and I thought I'd be there for a while, but I was there for a long time because I almost had kidney failure. It took a couple of weeks to stabilise me and then they operated on that, uh, but I almost croaked then. Yeah. And then later on I had a couple of bad things. So in, in fact, uh, your daughter Clarewyn has said that you had two <coughs> very close brushes with yes, death yeah, yeah. In, that, in that early period. Yeah. It was while I went in there with the with, with the kidney failure, that they did spot the leukaemia and the emphysema they already knew about, but they realised how bad it was. <coughs> it sounds particularly bad now because I'm getting, I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> how, how hard has the fight back been? Well, when you consider what people go through, and if you spend a lot of time around a hospital, you see it all the time. You've got to count yourself lucky. For example, this is the right time to be alive if you're sick because you might stay alive. Mm. And uh, I wouldn't have and had And if you can stay alive a little longer, it might be even better. Yeah, well, exactly. And you start, I, I'll tell you, just before I got sick, I was having illusions, fantasies, that I was world weary and I'd had enough of life and it wouldn't very ma matter very much if I disappeared. You know, I'd done it all, all that self-indulgent stuff. Those feelings vanished overnight as soon as I got sick and I just wanted to live. And I found this period when I have been ill, as I am now, as I sit here and talk to you, I'm, I'm not a well man, I find that it brings a clarity of mind and an ability to concentrate on the essential that I never had when I was well. When I was well, I was so energetic, I never noticed anything. Oh. I was sort of like, I was like a banzai bumblebee. I was everywhere, you're <laughs> but saying, I never concentrated. You're saying a need to prioritise yes. is much, much clearer. Yes, and bad health makes you, makes you think. There's a powerful poignancy, I think, about an essay that you wrote and delivered for radio in 2007 that you called Smoking the Memory, uh, which, I, which I think measured the depths of your dependence on nicotine How because after foolish. you gave it up, yeah. you were still smoking by memory for yes. a year until, of course, you went back to it. Then I went, but the way I went back to it is particularly <coughs> shameful, <laughs> is that I had a plan that I'll, yes, I'll smoke again, but I'll smoke the occasional cigarillo like Clint Eastwood. Yeah? Yeah? The, the dangerous cigarillo drooping from the laconic lip. Mm -hmm. Three or four a day. Within a week, I was chain smoking the things. 
Yeah. So it was worse than ever. Hmm. In March this year, you wrote a poem called Holding Court. And uh, if you'll indulge me, oh. I'll read a little bit of it. My body sensitive in every way, save one, can still proceed, proceed from, from chair to chair. chair. But, in mind, but in my mind, the fires are dying fast. Breathe through a scarf. Steer clear of the cold air. Think less of love and all that you have lost. You have no future, so forget the past. Let this be no occasion for despair. Cherish the prison of your waning day. Remember liberty and what it cost. Is that what you feel, the fires in your mind dying fast? I wasn't writing anything like that before I got ill. This is, this is quite a recent event. And it's got lines in it that I'm very proud of. And cherish, cherish the prison of your waning day. Is that what I wrote yes. there? Yes. I, I do feel that's what I'm doing. It's, you are restricted. But on the other hand, your restriction gives you a vision. So cherish it. Think less of love and all that you've lost? Ah, uh, we don't want to go into too many details here, Kerry, but uh, <coughs> let's say that my days, my days as a, what's the word I'm looking for? I better be very, very careful of my vocabulary here. My days of Somebody being who appreciates beauty. Dr yeah, dr drunk with the spectacle of female beauty a little bit behind me now, and ought to be. What are you working on at present? Oh, if only there were time to do it all. Uh, there's a sixth volume of memoirs. My younger daughter approves of my provisional title. The provisional title is Prelude to the Aftermath. <laughs> and uh, I said, I probably won't call it that. And she said, no, you must call it that. <laughs> you said in volume five, uh, on the TV years, on your television years, that in the next and final one, you'd try to sum up a lifetime of reflections on your own existence. Is that still the plan? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm about 10,000 words into it. I'm having far too much fun. <laughs> it was meant to, and I, I, must get, I must get serious. <laughs> also, my memory keeps going back to my early disasters, which has always been the, the basic, the bedrock of my writings. It's, it's not my, my later years in the limelight or in prominence, but my early catastrophes. Uh, they're funnier. Is it true to say that the writing has provided you with the central thread of your life? Oh, sure, there's no question. A writer is what I am, and I probably wouldn't have been very good at anything else. When you have such a passion for what essentially is at the core of your life, does that make you a selfish person? Necessarily and awkwardly and hard to live with. And uh, I mean, this is delicate territory, but it's not the ideal motivational force for someone who also wants to be a husband and father. But these things are very hard, I think, at times to separate, aren't they, when, when yeah. we reflect on our lives, work and family? Yeah. Particularly if you're passionate about both. Yeah, well, I've actually made a lot of time, especially in recent years, uh, I've taken time to reflect on how the actual life, the real life, actually connects up with the imaginative life. And the truth is the, the imaginative life would not be so rich unless the real life was there. The ideal of going away, living alone in a garret and uh, just being an artist is a, is a teenage fantasy, really. I mm. don't know whether you've thought about this, but it's nearly 50 years since you first came yeah. to Cambridge University. This library must have some very powerful memories I was, for you. I was here. I lived on the other side of this courtyard. So I spent time here, especially at night. A lot of things started here. And downstairs, in what used to be called the old library, it was a sort of underground dungeon. I think it's gone now. I think they demolished it. It used to be the venue for the Pembroke Smoker. It was a concert once a year. And everybody used to come to that concert. Peter Cook started it. Eric Idle directed it for years and then handed it over to me. And he showed me how to build the stage. We built it out of beer crates in the corner of the room. And all the undergrads and graduate students and dons came and all the fashionable women of the university were all there. And uh, it was there that in one show I produced, Jermaine Greer did her celebrated routine of Land of Hope and Glory, 
with her lips out of synchronization with right. the words, right. which some people think was the single funniest thing they ever saw. <laughs> there, were, there were grown men with knighthoods rolling on the floor. Uh, <laughs> the dons went crazy about her. Uh, it, was, it, was, it seemed like fun even at the time. These things always look good in the memory. And They're this, better in memory. And the, the smokers all fed into, um, I mean, the best of, I suppose, ended up in Footlights. Oh, sure. Which you there, also ran. Well, you could, um, I was president of Footlights as well, which sounds rather grand, but in fact, it just meant you've hung around long enough to get the job. I would do <coughs> two smoking concerts for Footlights every term, and then I'd do the Pembroke Smoker, and then you could sort of be guest star at the smoking concert of every other college. And there are a lot of colleges. So really you could be on stage practically continuously throughout your undergraduate career, and that's what I did. What I did was extracurricular activities. I really wasn't much of a student. Well, in fact, uh, I was going to say there was a pattern both at Sydney University and here uh, where you were, you were hoovering up all kinds of <coughs> literature, music, uh, any kind of serious culture that, that you could get your hands on. What you weren't doing much or anything of was the actual course. There was a terrible expression, set books, and I never could read the set books. And there was another expression, off the course, and I was off the course. I did everything that was off the course. It's a temperamental fault. It would have been easier for me if, if I'd just done what was set down for me. But uh, it wasn't in my nature. What was the Australia you left behind in 1961? Well, I would like to think that it was a primitive, undeveloped place <laughs> that I was well out of in my, in my search for a richer adventure. But the truth was, of course, that it was a startling country. It had everything. And one of the things that it had it was it offered the opportunity to see the world. You, know, you, you were rich enough to do that. I earned enough at the Sydney Morning Herald, my first newspaper, to save up and buy a ticket to England. So I did what everybody else did and I just got on a ship and went to see the world. Were you ever really clear what you wanted from England? Did you have any kind of a plan? I think lemmings have a better plan than I had. I had no idea. Uh, I got off the ship, I had 10 quid in my pocket. I lost that at my first party I went to. No, I had no, no plan. And I just followed my nose. And I, I bless it now because I ended up doing strange things just to stay alive, like working in a factory, for example. Uh, experience I still draw on. And, um, but no, there, there, there was no plan. I knew I wanted to be a writer and I was, I brought some poems with me and I wrote some more and I had what I thought was a collection of poems. Luckily, nobody published it. That was a blessing because I managed to get it to a few publishers and one or two of them kindly said it was promising, but luckily nobody published it because if they had, I'd be going around now trying to buy up every copy. <laughs> <laughs> because they were just not ready. Very few poets are ready early, one or two. Mm. You wrote that, um, that Cambridge was the one place where you could be everything that you yes. wanted to be all at once. Now, what did everything I encompass? I think it was probably the right time, you know. It was my middle 20s. I'm very glad I wasn't here earlier at the time the other undergraduate. I was older than the other undergraduates by a, just that crucial few years. And uh, so, I could, so I could see what the requirements were and find a way of getting around them. And I realised the extracurricular stuff was it. I realised that straight away. I knew that the, the thing to go for was footlights, drama and student journalism. And I started really to be a cultural journalist here. I would do, I worked, wrote for the Cambridge Review, I wrote film criticism, I wrote all kinds of essays and they started to get noticed in London because in those days, London, it probably still does, the editors would keep their eye on the universities. And uh, you get an invitation, would you like to review a book for us? Would I? Yes, I would. But the interesting thing was that, um, that with those reviews, you, you, the film reviews, you were writing for Cambridge Review. You broke a mould, didn't you? Because you were writing about Hollywood as much as you were writing, oh, about, sure. as yeah. much as you were writing about continental films. Yeah, or more. I go for the popular end every time. Yes suspecting that the real creativity might be there. And later when I became a TV critic, I did a lot of that. <laughs> when you first seriously hit the mainstream, it was by taking the exact, exact same approach with your television reviews yeah. as you had with your film reviews for the Cambridge yeah, that's, uh, review. That, that's this true. was with The Observer. 
Mm. You took popular art seriously, but also sent it up brilliantly. Did the, did the success surprise you? Yes, it, it got very popular very fast. But in those days, which are different from today, print journalism, print journalism were very strong, especially in London. And uh, about a million of the brightest people in the country took the Observer every Sunday. So we were really hitting an audience and I became part of the landscape. I wonder if you can remember your column on uh, Charles and Di's wedding, the wedding of the century. Oh, uh, because, because, I had fun writing Because those. people who read it at the time or read it in the book of columns would certainly remember. Uh, I had a lot of fun composing those things. I composed them like a mosaic because so much was happening. And what I did was I covered the coverage. Uh, the great Australian journalist who's dead now, Murray Sale, used to say, what matters isn't the story, it's the story of the story. And I would cover the coverage and I would write down what the TV commentators were saying and or what the celebrities were saying. And I, Barbara Cartland was asked her opinion and there she was on screen. And I was able to say that, that her eye makeup looked like the corpses of two crows <laughs> that had flown into a chalk cliff. And that was a case of a phrase <laughs> becoming well known. It still is, people quote it to me. <laughs> Flatteringly, people quote it back to me. <laughs> it's like later on I said that Arnold Schwarzenegger looked like a brown condom full of walnuts. That's, that people, one's come back. People, that one's, people <laughs> that'll that, be on my tombstone. People come No, it'll be on his. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you did get to hear of it. <clears throat> when the opportunity came for you to leave Fleet Street and perform for television, what was the lure that hooked you? It appealed to me to do television and it did for a long time. And I didn't quit until the year 2000. And that was because I wanted to get back to have all my concentration available for writing again. Also, it was getting a bit hard. I wasn't, I wasn't young anymore. But I think also, didn't you find values changing? Didn't you find? Yes, it got very, very hard to, to, focus. In, to interview the people I wanted to interview. I wanted to interview a ballerina. They wanted me to interview a Spice Girl. They were right, because if you interview the Spice Girl, the figures go up by a million. Actually, it's a million people who eat crisps, but it's another million people. So I could see it from their viewpoint. It's just that it wasn't, it wasn't my interest. So how do you look back now on those television years that catapulted you into stardom? With gratitude, because it would be churlish not to. Uh, it made me well known here and in Australia, not in America, only a few of my shows went to America. Um, <clears throat> but I was grateful for the attention, and which I still get, because people don't forget that you've been on television. In fact, they're in the impression, they've always got the impression you're still on it. A lot of awkward stuff comes with it. Uh, and that I'm not grateful for. I'm not really, although I love the limelight, I'm not made for media attention. Well, in fact, uh, your daughter, Claire one. Must be very wise, Clive. Must be very <laughs> observant. She's perceptive. She's talked of your conflicting sides that don't sit comfortably yes. together. Quote, he's a showman and a recluse at the yes. same time and has conflicting impulses of gregariousness and the need to be alone to work. She's clever, isn't she? Mm. That, that's exactly true. Well, she had a box yeah, But on the other hand, I'm not so sure I'm the only person who's had conflicting impulses. And that, again, is a subject. The way being ill and approaching death is a subject. And writers love subject. I'm writing things now I never would have written before. And uh, I can write about in Memoirs, Volume 6, this very division in my nature. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not nothing to weep about. Claire when the wise, again, <laughs> quote, fame is distorting, uncomfortable and toxic. I was in my late teens when he was suddenly on TV a lot. His TV persona didn't seem to be him. To me, he's someone who reads, thinks and writes poetry. Isn't she? She's, Perceptive. She's so clever, in fact, quite damning when she says that. You know that terrible thing that John Updike said, that fame is a mask that eats the face? Well, Clarence saw that. But uh, I think I did a, probably a better job than my family thinks. First of all, of protecting them from the on rush of interest and also I didn't go quite entirely crazy. It's very easy to go crazy. 
Of course, you'll always be remembered as the man who discovered Japanese television in all its uh, glorious eccentricity for the I'm rest of the world. It's, uh, it's going to go. That's going to go on my gravestone too. Japanese game show man dies. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Japanese game show man dies. Yes, there's no way out of that one. Uh, it seemed like an original idea at the time. Uh, we had a stringer in Tokyo who sent us this footage. In those days, you had to ship everything by air in, in a parcel. There was no electronic transference. And there was miles of this stuff and I took one look at it and thought, this, well, this is great. You'll have to edit it down, but this is just ideal. And, um, and it took off straight away. <laughs> The contestants have to stand on their hands and lean their bare bodies against the blistering metal. A dangling bit of cactus stops them falling forwards and strips of cactus stuck to the hot steel make sure they don't fall sideways. Remember that where the Japanese come from, it's just a game. What I didn't know was that the actual shows we were looking at were going to influence the whole of television all over the world. Strapped to a wooden framework from which they can't escape, they are dusted with powdered fish food. Hungry catfish wait in the river for the contestants to join them for lunch. <laughs> Those who drown are not allowed to go forward to the next day. It was the beginning of, of reality TV in the sense that the, the participants must suffer. And if you turn on TV now, there are people suffering all over the, all over the place. What special qualities did you endeavour to bring to your interviewing? I'm not so sure how good an interviewer I was. I found it quite difficult to ask an awkward question, the question that the the other person didn't want to answer. I never could do that. Well, you're saying that <laughs> and I'm immediately thinking of Roman Polanski. Well, Polanski, see, there was a deal on there. Polanski knew that if I was going to help him plug his book, he would have to answer the question about the underage girl. The reason he answered it is that Polanski didn't see anything wrong with it. You've got to get that clear in your head. When the newspapers and the magazines and the books talk about you and little girls, right, is there anything in it? Well, I, I like young women, let's put it this way. I think most of men do, actually. Yeah, but the question, the question turns on how young, doesn't it? Well, yes, well, here you come to a, to a concrete uh, um, case for which I have been <clears throat> uh, behind the bars, and that's what you want to talk about. It. Doesn't the age of consent mean precisely that, that under a certain age, whatever age it may be, it doesn't matter if the girl says yes or not, or wants to or not? that you're supposed not to because it's... Yes, I know, I know, in that particular state. That's, a, a, again, no, a question of, you know... <clears throat> everywhere in the West has got some sort of age. No, but you see, if you, if you think of the United States, there are st the stage when the age of consent is 12. Polanski is a European refugee who'd seen the SS wiping out his family. He just didn't think there was much wrong with what he'd done. The rest of us do, and I think we're right. But he didn't, so that's why he answered the question. So I didn't have to probe for that. It wasn't, wasn't difficult. Catherine Hepburn, that would have been a slightly That was different... difficult because there were things she didn't want to talk about. Hmm. She didn't want to talk about uh, Howard Hughes. She didn't want to talk about Spencer Tracy. I asked a clever question of her about Hughes. I congratulate myself. <laughs> I said, when I finally got to it, the way I framed the question was, some people think that falling in love with you was the only sane thing Howard Hughes ever did. And she was stuck. She had to answer it. And she did. I can't even mention Hughes. Well, you could mention Hughes. He was flying around the world. Well, it just did occur Very to me that... Very distinguished just, man. It just did occur to me that falling for you is the only sane thing he ever did. I, I think it was on a par with the rest of the things he did. But <laughs> poor Howard. He was a brilliant man. You know, he was deaf. At 15, he was deaf. Seriously deaf. I think it's what made Howard eccentric. What I didn't do, of course, was uncover all the secrets of Catherine Hepburn. She didn't want them uncovered. 
So while you were leading this double life in your television years, yeah. you were building your bank of poetry, writing memoirs yes, and I'll... essays. The poetry was always your first Always love. there, from the first. When I arrived in Sydney University, on the first day I met my first poet, and I knew instantly that I wanted to be one of them. And I've written poetry all my life. I like to think that I'm getting better. You've said that, uh, that when you write prose, you quote, try to write the phrase that will get past people's defences and get right into the middle of their head before they get a chance to censor it yes. on the way in. How yeah. does that differ from when you write poetry? You've got to get people's attention straight away and that's where show business comes in. I actually write show business poetry in the sense that the poem is actually working for attention from the first phrase. Every phrase in the poem has to be as good as those phrases in prose. I once said about, I once, listen to this. I once, You're quoting yourself. <laughs> I once said, modestly, <laughs> I went, modest that I am, I once said that all I do is turn a phrase until it catches the light. Well, the second part is the interesting part. You, you've got to turn a phrase that people are startled by. Is it also in the process, is it the purest distillation yes. of thoughts? I think so. But some, some would say philosophy is, and I don't know which is, which is true. I love writing what I would regard as philosophical prose where I, where I work on a, a concept and try and tease it out and explain it and so on. But um, no, I think poetry is the distillation. You wrote in volume three of your memoirs in 1990 that if you had an important book in you, it would be what uh, happened in the Pacific in the war. Oh. But you said it would take a decade to prepare even before you began to write. You got at least as far as the title, River in the Sky, but what happened to the book? You see what happens when you make predictions? <laughs> I got, got sick, that's the, and the River in the Sky would be a big project. I don't think there, there's time for it. The urge is still there. Why did it not really get going? I knew I'd have to do it at the end of my life when everything else was done. It was going to take time. It was going to be my, my swan song. But, but all started because you lost your father yeah, to the Pacific think War, even though the war itself was over. It's quite obviously the motivating point of my life, although how it motivated me is a big question. I think seeing my mother's helplessness, and she was a... She wasn't a helpless woman. Like many women of a generation, she was terrific at the whole business of, of running the house and having a job. And she, she used to smock babies' clothes. Uh, very intricate, finny, finicky work. And on top of her widow's pension, pension that kept us alive. Uh, no, she was a very capable woman, my mother. But, uh, but there was such a cruelty about the way he died that, that he'd survived the war as a prisoner, ending up as a prisoner in Japan. Yeah. He's released yeah. you and your mother, but particularly your mother, I would imagine, because you had not yeah, really known. Mm. Had this expectation that he was coming back. He'd survived the war and he was coming home. And the telegram came instead. I was there when she got the telegram. Yes, it was, it was cruel, but it was... It was only bad luck. Uh, it, was bad, a, it was a huge impact on yes, two lives. I got the sense that nothing was nailed down after that. And I also got the sense that I had to have the life that they might have had, a productive life. I think it probably motivated everything. But that was the main conclusion I drew at the, at the mature and wise age of six. Mm. <laughs> you think? Was <laughs> that uh, the universe, creation, providence, they're not on your side, it's just chance. After the first of two visits to your father's grave in Hong Kong, you revealed in a poem called Son of a Soldier mm. that at the age of 55, you cried authentically yes. for the first time, an opening of the floodgates. What do you mean by crying well, authentically for the first time at 55? <coughs> it was my impression that that, that that was true, that I felt that I'd, until then I'd been locked up and I was at last facing a truth about not just my life, but life itself. First for the hurt I had done to those I loved, then for myself, for what had been done to me in the beginning, to make my heart so cold. Yeah. Do we take that literally? Yes, I, I think a I did. A cold heart? I think I did have a cold heart, and to a certain extent, 
still do. That doesn't make me a monster. There are people with a lot colder hearts than I have, but I have got, I think I got scarred and injured when I was very young by but, that incident. But does that mean not trusting your emotions, not wanting to invest emotion in others? I mean, Not realising at the time what the emotion is, yeah. Yes, yes, protective mechanism. I don't want to go into too many details because it gets into, gets into personal territory. But um, yes, that's a, I'd say that was a characteristic, is sort of a cold detachment. Had you come home, I would not be what I am, I cried. Yes. I could have loved my mother less and not searched for more like her among others, parched for a passion undimmed by distress while you lay deep behind that looming dam. What were you saying? What I was saying is I don't think my personality would have been as it turned out. I think my father, my father would have told me things, but he wasn't there to do so. And I... What might he have told you? He would have told you to find someone, love her and don't be stupid. Your wife Prue was there with you and you wrote, I turned to meet her eyes. Let me explain, I said to her. My tears were trapped because he left me to be tender, strong and brave who was none of these things, inflamed by fright, the love that he did not return to make to the first woman I knew and could not help became in me a thirst I could never slake for one more face transfigured by delight. Uh, O'Brien, how sly you are to dig away and find all these revelations, which in fact... There are many of them. In fact, I published them. You did, <laughs> you did. Nobody ever made himself more clear or more vulnerable. Yes. Uh, so honesty there, honesty yes. there, not lies. Beginning of honesty. Mm. Honesty about emotions is quite hard. Mm. Do you think that's true for all or more for you? True for me, yeah. Whether what's true for me is true for everybody is a question I'm still addressing. Mm. Uh, I think the idea that everyone else in the world is like yourself is called solipsism and I hope I'm not guilty of it. Those years growing up in Cogra were, were the most powerful, yes. powerfully formative uh, years of your life. How much of the kid from Cogra is still in you? Oh, it's still me. Oh, and there's no question of it. The kid from Cogra is sitting before you. Uh, I think, uh, I don't, can't remember whether it was Auden or Stravinsky, or maybe it was both of them. But let's say it was Auden who said that he always felt as if he was the youngest person in the room. Yeah. I still feel that. The galloping sense of insecurity? Yeah, well, just a, I feel a lot of the people are wiser and more mature than I am. I wouldn't say it was insecurity so much as inadequacy. Mm. And that goes all the way back? Oh, sure. <coughs> <coughs> In fact, the very thought of it brings on a coughing fit. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there are... There are at least apparent contradictions in us all, but you paint yourself as this kid who was outwardly gregarious, always in the action, playing Joe Cool or trying to play Joe Cool, but also lonely, uh, an anxiety to belong. It's a good subject, don't forget that. Yeah. And that's why you can never trust a writer. Right. They dramatise themselves. I've just read Unreliable Memoirs again. God uh, bless you. And it still made me laugh out <laughs> loud in the most embarrassing places, but <laughs> your description of the Billy Cart days has to be an absolute classic. Can you recall your piece de resistance, which was the Billy Cart super train the su and, Mrs. <laughs> and, and Mrs. Branthwaite's The super poppies. train, the super train. There's a big thing I've got to say about this when I finish the story. Mrs. Branthwaite had the house on the corner uh, where one street turned into another. Let's call it the corner. And you remember the front strip? I think they still got the administrator. Beyond the footpath, there's a strip of green between there and the kerb and some people would plant flowers there. And Mrs. Branthwaite had a, the world's, the, the district's anyway, the greatest collection of poppies, the greatest display of poppies, carefully cultivated. And she was known to call the police if anyone even picked one of them. It was down the hill that I projected the billy cart, which I'd been inspired to build. The super cart was my billy cart, followed by all the other billy carts had been bolted onto it. And there were about 20 kids in it, including little kids with their koalas and dummies. Yeah. And it came steaming down the hill. With all the people coming out of their houses to watch Oh, everyone was phenomenon. watching, yes. And they even stopped hosing. And people would hose you because of the noise of the, 
the noise that the ball raised, the ball bearing wheels made. But they were looking in awe as this thing came thundering <laughs> down the hill and into the turn, into the next tree. And of course, it was while I was making the turn, I realised I'd miscalculated <laughs> because the thing wouldn't follow the first cart around. It would lash its enormous tail, which it did. And <laughs> it wiped out all Mrs. Branthwaite's poppies. The air was full of them and full of little kids and dummies. And it was carnage. And she came out of the house and saw this and had a stroke. And <laughs> had to be helped away. She was taken away in a van, or well, she was in my memory. <laughs> now we get to the question of my memory. Let me tell you something about that hill. I went back to it years later. It's very flat. <laughs> <laughs> you see the danger. Everything's relative. The danger of writers. <laughs> Especially with their childhood memories, because they remember everything on it, the way childhood exaggerates. Mm. But at the same time, you, you said, uh, once that there's as much hidden about you in the memoir as there is revealed. Yes, I've got a feeling they may have revealed more than they hid. But what did you want to hide? I was discontented with ordinary life. I'd like to have been free to do everything, which you, know, you can't be, I can't go into detail because it would be breaking faith with people breaking faith with my own family. But although I realised that being a married man was the centre of my existence and the anchor and the secret of my existence, which it still is, I'm not built for it. I'm built to be Ulysses. Not physically, perhaps, but to be out there, to see everything, to be the universal adventurer, universal lover, all those things. Do you understand what that springs from? Do you understand what it is in hunger. you? Hunger. Hunger. Yes. And I don't know what, where the hunger comes from. In the early memoirs, you, uh, you paint your mother as a relatively simple, solitary, long-suffering figure who lived for her son and often despaired of him. But you eventually wrote about 30 years, I think, after you left for England that you'd come to realise she was quite a sophisticated woman. Yes. A, uh, a natural psychologist, you said, whose letters revealed a gifted writer. Tell oh, me yes. about that. Yes, I underestimated her. Um, the, there were several tragedies in the life of my mother and indeed that generation of women <coughs> was higher education was unavailable to most of them. Mm. And because my, her father, my grandfather was a wastrel, having ruined one family in England, he came all the way to Australia to ruin another family, gambler. And because of that, she had to leave school at 13 and uh, she spent her teens on the production lines at General Motors Holden. And never had the education she could have had. What difference have we would have made, we don't know, but later on it did strike me that I'd had all the privileges that she hadn't. The thing which bothers me now. You must have poured a lot of effort uh, in the post-television years uh, into producing such a monumental work as Cultural Amnesia, a collection of more than 100 essays on mostly 20th century figures, the great writers, philosophers, despots, yeah. politicians, musicians, even comic actors, described by the Nobel Prize winning uh, author J.M. Kurtzey as majestic and acutely provocative, a crash course in civilization. You've described it as a book designed to start arguments it's attracted all kinds of favourable comments as well as unfavourable ones all over the world. It was a, my first big success in America and it's read in places like India, which pleases me greatly. Yes, and it's, it's, meant it is, it's meant to start the subject in each time. Sometimes I don't even tackle the person that I nominally am writing the essay about. I just go off at a tangent. Yes. It's really a book of what human beings were capable of. Yes. Is it not? And, and, and what they did in the 20th century, mm. from the brilliant and inspirational to the absolutely despicable. Hitler is there, <coughs> at one extreme, and then one of his victims, a little girl called Sophie Scholl. Sophie Scholl was one of the Munich conspirators that the Nazis executed in 1942. Uh, and she was only, she's very young. And. Um, that's, I think, is my key essay in there. But ideally, in a book like that, every essay is a key essay because every essay leads somewhere else. Yes. 
You, you were obviously impressed by the cafe society in Vienna and yes. to a slightly lesser extent Berlin, but dominated by Jewish intellectuals uh, before the rise of Nazism. Now, what was it about that cafe well, society that impressed you so much? The cafe was the house of wit, of learning and irresponsibility. Um, and people weren't model citizens. They were quite the opposite. They were all characters. It was, it was the opposite of the totalitarian mentality. And of course, it was very intelligent and very funny. And the things you like about Hollywood, the Hollywood moguls cracking their terrific jokes, that all comes from Viennese cafe society. It runs right through the century and, and still does, I think. You observe with regard to the fate of the Jews, there could be no clearer proof uh, that the mind is hard to kill, nor could there be a more frightening demonstration of the virulent power of the forces that can combine to kill it. There's such a thing as evil. One of the philosophers, Stuart Hampshire, modern philosopher, was at Nuremberg. One of his jobs was to interrogate the Nazi prisoners. And he had been a philosopher uh, who was very strong on the idea there was no such thing as evil. And you can make a good case for the fact that there isn't, for the idea there isn't. And then he met Carlton Brunner, who'd been the head of the SS. And he came away and it changed, his whole philosophy had changed. There is such thing as evil. It can show up in little things. Sometimes it's just, it's just so petty. That, that was something in the Soviet Union that was standard. You make life impossible for the independent thinker. You take away their union membership. They can't eat in the cafeteria. They can't get work. You, and you peck them to death. Uh, that's evil. And after all these reflections and all this accumulation of knowledge, are you a wiser person, person yourself? Knowledge is supposed to bring wisdom. I think I had to be. I think I was such a klutz. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, yes, it's not, I think I had to be wise. I'm kind of, since I, uh, <coughs> my recent disasters, I've grown a lot wiser. But I, I know I was unusually unwise when young. Mm. John Lennon said, Count your age by friends, not years. Count your life by smiles, not tears. To the extent that you can define your life by the company that you've kept, what would it say about you? Do you know, that line of his, count your life by friends, strikes home to me because I probably didn't do a no good enough, in fact, I know I didn't do a good enough job of, of cultivating and keeping my friendships. I took them as they came along. It was easy come, easy go. When I look back on it, I wish I'd, live differently, but that means wishing to be a different person. It's a sore point, this, because I'm probably too, too good at solitude. And uh, I try to avoid obligations, and sometimes you shouldn't. Do you think that means you took the friends for granted, that they'd always yeah. be there when you needed yeah, them or wanted tend, them? I tended to. And possibly, I hope, I don't do that so much anymore. Now, I'll tell you a big difference between now and then. It's nowadays I go to funerals because fairly soon one of those funerals might be mine. You've talked more than once about the importance of women in your life. Oh, you've gosh. Said, you've said, I've yeah. always been extremely susceptible to the beauty of women. Here comes trouble. I don't know why you ever <laughs> actually said that in public. Because I was a fool. <laughs> I should have shut <laughs> the F up. You're not alone in that. But, <laughs> but does this go all the way back to your childhood yes. too? I've always thought that the face of a beautiful and preferably intelligent woman was a revelation of God. And I suppose at some level I still, still do. Sometimes the beautiful woman isn't quite as intelligent as I suspected or thought she was. Um, but that's because men are romantic. One of the reasons I've found women so attractive is they're less romantic, they're more realistic. So when they say they like you, they're probably telling the truth. Right, right. <laughs> it's an infinite subject. And someday I'll find a way of getting at it. I still don't know, quite know how. So what sort of a routine have you been able to develop to cater for the illness? I never in my life had a routine uh, in which I could get up in the morning, sit down at a certain time and write. So I don't miss that because I never had it. But uh, necessarily, now that I'm ill, I spend most of the day asleep, which is very boring. Most of the night and quite a lot of the day. And um, then there are visits to clinics over and over. Uh, one clinic of another kind or another every few days. Mm. And when I do manage to write, it's usually my, 
my Daily Telegraph TV column, which I put together piece by piece over a couple of days. And then if there's any time left over from that, I might do an article or, blessedly, work on a poem. But you couldn't call it a routine. In fact, um, when you did write a poem at about the time that you were diagnosed and you were clearly pissed off that, um, that it took you half a day to write one page yes. double-spaced. Yes, it, it was a cry of pain. That was, it was when I, just when I was getting sick, wasn't it? Yes. I've got to realise that I'm working on 50% power and try and use that economically. But it takes some getting used to, because I was always accustomed to working as much as I like. It's one of the reasons why writers generally, and me specifically, specifically were so hard to live with, is I'd be up at three o'clock in the morning writing. You know, the idea came, you get up and write it. Mm. And why at this point in your life, when time is of the very essence, uh, would you use up so much of it translating someone else's work? There were at least a thousand translations of Dante. And most of them will bore you to tears, especially in the second books, Purgatory and Paradise, because they're simply not poetic enough. And the Divine Comedy is a poem. It must be, it must be poetic. But, you, uh, but you're also translating 14th century Italian yeah. as well as well, his own particular... That's true. Although 14th century Italian is practically Italian because Dante invented the language. Dante pulled all these dialects together into this great poem and created the language we know as Italian today. I'd always wanted to do it. And just after 9-11, I was on holiday in Greece and I finally figured out how to do it, to turn Dante's... Terza rima, that's the triple rhyme, which is impossible in English or very hard to do it in quatrains, which I've been practicing for all my life and I was quite good at, in, in my own opinion. So I knew how to do it, but it still took years. How big an issue is it in the literary world to take someone else's, particularly someone like Dante, and to actually change the structure of their poetry? On the whole, it's been a pretty good critical reception. I'll give you an example of what I did. Uh, the inscription over the gate of hell, uh, which in the Longfellow translation has the famous last line, abandoned hope all ye that hand to hear. Right. I didn't want to reproduce Longfellow's line and I did find there was room to introduce a line of my own, but the trick was to make that good enough for Dante. So this is the way the, the this is the inscription over the gate of hell, can do three, and the last stanza goes, this is the gate of hell talking to people who are about to enter hell. A big voice, right? From now on, every day feels like your last forever. Let that be your greatest fear. Your future now is to regret the past. Forget your hopes. They were what brought you here. You see, I think that last line is not bad. And it's not his. <laughs> I, I made that one up and stuck it on. And when, the, when some of the well, reviewers... So how do the traditionalists deal with it? Well, they, don't, they go nuts. If, if you're lucky, they give you some praise for invention and originality. Now, it was your wife, Prue, who opened you up to Dante in the first place, wasn't yes. it? Yes, I mean, God bless her. Uh, she's a noted scholar mm. yes. on Dante. What did she bring to the table for you? Oh, everything. It was in Florence in the early 60s. You need some music here. <laughs> <laughs> romantic music, because it's a very romantic scene. We weren't married yet. We were a couple of exiles living in sin in Florence. And uh, she knew everything about Dante. And I wanted to know how it worked. And she opened up the first book, The Inferno, Hell, to Canto V, this, the episode of Paolo and Francesca. And she showed me how the verse worked. And immediately I was enthralled. It was a big thing for me. It was a big thing for me and her. In fact, it was, it was a romance that's still in a way going on 45 years later. I should say that, you know, we're still married and still involved, but you don't get more involved than when you're reading something together. And strangely enough, the bit we were reading is about two lovers who are reading a book. And uh, it was a big moment for me, but what I didn't know then and didn't find out for another 40 years was how I could possibly work in English. You've written quite a bit about your wife in both memoirs uh, and poems, uh, albeit under another name. Uh, Prue became Francoise. Francoise. 
In uh, 2005, you wrote an anniversary serenade to prove. Yes. You are my alcohol and nicotine, my silver flask and cigarette machine, my share of heaven and my sheer delight, my soda fountain and my water sprite. And it moves on. Do you on. notice the first two things are about <laughs> booze and fags? That's right. <laughs> The colours fade that we nail to the mast. We lose the future, but we own the past. We own the past from our first kiss, a lifetime to the last. Yeah, and uh, when I wrote her a poem, I always did my best. She's like that. When I translated Dante, I did my best. You've obviously been hit hard by the troubles in your marriage, although uh, Claire one says the two of you are reconciled but still separated. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is gonna be good. Regardless of what's happened. Mm. Prue has obviously been incredibly important to you. Yes. I know you're still married, yeah. but what, what are the chances of you getting back together? It's a difficult question. It's up to her. We're not divorced. It's been 45 years and we're still involved. We're in communication with each other. It really is up to her, but I have no other plans. You once told me that even after all the time away, you still had the fantasy that you might return to Australia before the end yes. to maybe live yeah, in Sydney on the harbour and dangle uh, a fishing line in the water. But that was, that was always going to be a fantasy, yes, wasn't it? Probably won't happen, but it happens in my imagination. And finally, the imagination is everything because the imagination is formed in the place you want to talk about. My imagination was formed in Sydney. I see in colours because Sydney was brightly coloured. I see through clear light because Sydney had clear light. Mm. If I can read again from that poem you wrote on getting your deadly cocktail of diagnoses. <laughs> if I, that is, should finally succumb to, to these infirmities, infirmities I'm, I'm slow, slow to, to learn, learn the, names the names of, lest my brain be rendered numb with boredom, even as I toss and turn, then send my ashes home where they can fall in their own sweet time from the harbour wall. Yes, I actually mean that. How they'll get my ashes home, I don't know. I think you have to buy a first class seat on Emirates. It's, it's a big deal. Nothing's easy. But when the ashes arrive there, I hope there'll be a few people, perhaps yourself included, who'll be there for the tipping. But I the like, ashes into the harbour. I it's like beautiful the, there on, you know the spot across from McMahon's point, the, the, that point beside Circular Quay. Yeah, the, yeah. Mm. I, I like, like the, the idea that, that they'd fall in their own sweet time. Yes, that's a crucial. That's, that's the culmination of the poem. Because you're, you're gone, so it's up, to, it's up to them what your ashes do. Mm. Your ability to control your life is, is finished. If you could have written your own ending, what would it be? I know what I won't do. I won't be buying a ticket to Switzerland so I can book into some clinic and pay people to put me into a long, deep sleep. I can get that from television here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I won't be helping the process. You wrote a valedictory to the English poet Philip Larkin, yes. who you greatly admired, uh, which ended with the line, your immortality complete at last. Ah, did I say that? That's you a... did. So I did. What do you most want to be remembered for? Well, uh, it's hard to say. I would like, of course, for someone to suddenly recite a whole poem at some romantic moment to a suitable listener. I'm not so sure that will happen. Uh, I'm not so sure that people will even read a single book but I think if they do, it's likely that it'll be unreliable memoirs because it's part of the Australian landscape and part of the British landscape. Unreliable memoirs, God bless it. It's been 34 years now, 35 years that it's been in print. It's gone through about 100 editions. Is a dream of Australia, or it shows Australia as a dream. And it's also Britain's dream of Australia. Now, I'm, I'm going to read um the poem that you had published relatively recently uh -huh. that you called in French, Lessons from the Darkness. I should have been more kind. It, it is, is my, my fate, fate to find this out. To find this out, but find it out too late. The mirror holds the ruins of my face roughly together, thus reminding me I should have played it straight in every case, not just when forced to. Far too casually, I broke faith when it suited me and here, 
I am alone and now the end is near. So I'd like to hear you just comment on that. Well, I was pretty deep in the pit when I wrote that. That was more than a year ago. I was, I was sick. I was uh, being really banished from home by my family. Um, and I meant it. On the other hand, I also meant the way the poem is constructed. And it sounds quite neat and vigorous. This is the saving grace of this kind of poetry. To make it work, you've got to give the reader a reason for going on with it. And it's got its own strength and music, I like to think. But that's, that, that's one of the things I meant by it, that I'm still here, I'm still writing. So, but also I mean that I've, I've faced the facts and uh, the, ending, the end is getting close. But now I have slowed down, I breathe the air as if there were not much more of it there and write these poems which are funeral which songs. Which are funeral songs that have been taught to me by vanished time, not only to enumerate my wrongs, but to pay homage to the late sublime that comes with seeing how the years have brought a fitting end, if not the one I sought. It gives thanks for the fact that I'm here at all, that I'm here to write it, that I have the power and the powers to reflect on experience. Most people don't get that. A lot of people get subtracted from the world without a chance to comment. That's why I often think of my father uh, crashing in the plane, the plane going down on Taiwan. He must have had a few seconds to think, well, this is it. And I've had a better chance than that. And since I have certain powers of expression, I owe it to the world and to my country to, to say it as well as I can. I think that could be fairly said. Clive James, yes. I know this hasn't been easy for you, but thank you very much. Well, I appreciate it, I really do.